Hello again, botany friends. My name is Saskia, and I am a botany teacher and enthusiast, and I'm currently studying for the California Certified Botanist exam. This exam tests your knowledge of the native and introduced plants of California and the rules and regulations surrounding botanical surveys and policy. This is a third video that I've made for the plant families in California that are required for the exam. If you're interested in watching more of these videos, you can find the playlist named Plant Families on my YouTube channel. Before you start this video, I have attached the script to this video and the PowerPoint associated that you're welcome to download. Also, all the links to scientific papers and images are in the notes section of the PowerPoint if you are interested in reading them. For today's topic, I will be reviewing the beautiful and charismatic group of plants in the Eudicot family Azoaceae, commonly known as the fig marigold family or live forevers. They can also be called Fagis in South Africa and New Zealand. This family is best known for its showy daisy-like flowers, such as those seen in the plants known as ice plants or mesems, as well as their often very succulent leaves. However, some of the members of this family have much more demure flowers and only slight, slightly succulent leaves, as is evidenced in those in the early diverging members of the family. This family has undergone extensive phylogenetic research in the past two decades through investigations into both nuclear and chloroplast DNA. This has led to many reclassifications of plants in the Azoaceae, uh, of which I encountered many reclassifications even from 2014 to 2021. There have been a lot of reclassifications. However, as I'll show you later, although there are many reclassifications, they do share many features, including often having opposite succulent leaves and similar geographical origins. The origin of the Azoaceae dates back to over 40 million years ago. And since they have mostly succulent leaves, these origins also trace to mostly deserts and warm coastlines of southern Africa. In the images on this slide is a showcase of the succulent leaves of xerophytic plants such as Conophytum, Lithops, Tetragonia, and Carpobrotus as well as the showy flowers of Lampranthus and Carpobrotus and the very beautiful fruit capsules present in mostly later diverging members of the family. The Azoaceae belongs to a large order of plants called the Caryophyllales in the clade Eudicots. The Caryophyllales currently contains 37 families in the order. These families include plant families such as the cactus family, stone plants, the Azoaceae, pinks, amaranths, foraclorks, smartweeds, purslane, and even carnivorous plants such as sundews and pitcher plants. Plants in this order are known for their cosmopolitan distribution throughout the world and that they're found on all continents in all major terrestrial ecosystems. They're also known for their convergence of trait evolution and extreme ecophysiological adaptations such as drought or cold tolerance like cacti and stone plants, heavy metal accumulation, carnivory such as sundews, differences in pigment types, unique photosynthetic pathways, and succulents of either the leaves or the stems or both. Plants in this order also come in a variety of growth habits, such as trees, shrubs, vines, mangroves, or just annuals. This order contains 749 genera and 11,620 species. Within the 
a Zoaceae, there are currently 145 genera and around 1,800 species in the family. The Caryophyllales, like many of those of many large plant clades, remain unclear, and phylogenetic studies often recover alternative hypotheses. And this is very true for the Azoaceae. If we take a closer look at the Caryophyllales phylogeny, these are the types of plants that are in the Caryophyllales, especially these images on the right by Brockington et al. in 2009, showcasing the diversity of perianth forms in the Caryophyllales, such as Bougainvillea and Nyctanginaceae, Claytonia, st and Stellaria in the Caryophyllaceae, Cact Opuntia flowers in the Cactaceae, Aptenia and Sesuvium in the Azoaceae, and other smaller groups within the Caryophyllales. Just a huge diversity of form, colors, shapes, and sizes. Really remarkable. On the left here is a diagram called a chronogram made by Walker et al. in 2018. A chronogram is a type of phylogenetic tree whose branch lengths indicate the age of the clade and the taxa within those clades. So the longer the branch, the older the group is. This chronogram maps the whole genome of the Caryophyllales and shows diversification shifts for which in the Caryophyllales is 681 times this order has diversified into new groups and new species. Really remarkable. It's a huge order of plants. The order itself is divided into what are called core versus non-core caryophyllales, which is just an indication of synapomorphies that the cary core caryophyllales have versus the non-caryophyllales. The whole order is defined by specific DNA sequences, mitochondrial enzymes, and specific morphological characters like how the anther wall develops in vessel element types in the xylem. While the core of Caryophyllales is defined by certain synapomorphies such as specific types of sieb tubes, pigments called betalanes, specific types of pollen wall form and ovary types, and what's present in their seeds. This chronogram that we're seeing right now is showing pretty much all the diversification in taxa within the Caryophyllales, and it's highlighting the most prominent families here that have the most species. However, just note that there are many families that are much smaller embedded within this chronogram. Here we have the Azoaceae right here. Early phylogenetic studies of the Azoaceae used chloroplasts in nuclear DNA to show that there are four subfamilies called the Sesuvoidae, the Azoidae, Mesembryanthemoidae, and the Rushioidae. However, recent phylogenetic work done in 2017 by Clack et al. found that there is another subfamily called the Acrosanthoidae, which is just made up of one species. The Azoaceae as a family evolved about 41.5 million years ago after a peak in global temperature that started to occur around 50 million years ago. This increase in global temperature coincided with the presence of many new open habitats and the development of an arid adapted vegetation, which is very much the case for pretty much all the species in this family are very well adapted to dry, low rain conditions. In the Azoaceae, 
The greatest diversity is in the subfamily Rushioidea, and especially in the latest diverging tribe called Rushiae. This hyperdiversification, which when you consider the how old the rest of the family is, was quite puzzling for researchers. And even when they looked at the climate at the time, which was arid, and the increased number of fossilized pollen grains after about 8 million years ago, they still weren't sure why there were so many plants that had evolved in such a short period of time. However, they found that it's most likely that nuclear genes regulating plant development led to the diversification of plant species in the tribe because they allowed for a wide range of morphological form and leaf shapes that are seen today. So if you see it, Rushier, they have a wide variety of leaf shapes and forms, which make them very, very successful in the habitats in which they reside. And here's just a table to give you an idea of the subfamilies by the numbers and where they generally reside. The only thing that's missing here is the one very tiny subfamily, the Acrocentoidae, which has one genus and only six species. Now for the Azoaceae, it is the largest family of leaf succulent plants in the entire world. And what's even more interesting is that most of these species are endemic to winter rainfall regions of southern Africa called the Greater Cape Floristic Biome, which is this area right around here, right in the southern Cape of South Africa. However, the family is also generally associated with the succulent Karoo Biome of the Great Cape floristic region. And the succulent Karoo biome is notable for the world's richest flora of succulent plants and harbors about one third of the world's approximately 10,000 succulent species. And is able to harbor so many because they have mild oceanic and fog conditions combined with low but predictable rainfall during the winter and also with periodic droughts. This combination of drought and predictable rainfall allows for regular germination in space for seedling recruitment and is thought to contribute to the exceptionally high diversity in the area. Additionally, soils in the northern part of the Karoo biome show an exceptionally high diversity in spatial variability in both physical and chemical properties, possessing special features which influence the ability of water and may be important in governing biodiversity. When we look at the ancestry of the Azoaceae, the first diverging subfamily is the subfamily Sesuvoidea. This subfamily originated in Africa and Arabia, so kind of in this area, which suggests an African origin for the entire family. However, there are some fam subfamilies that have are present in South America and Australia. And this has been attributed to long distance dispersal of fruits and seeds by birds or early humans. And as they reached these new continents, they were able to irradiate in those environments. Nowadays, we do see these growing in areas that they are not native to due to in a couple last hundred years, people bringing them over, for example, to California for several either ornamental or erosion reduction purposes. These t plants tend to grow in pretty nutrient poor soils of sandstone or quartz, or they grow in sand. And while there might be a lot of genera and species, very few of the genera are widespread. Most of them tend to occur in this area. 
Now let's look at some general characteristics of Azoaceae plants. For the flowers, they are bisexual and have four to five fused sepals, zero to 200, up to 250 petals, one to up to 500 stamens, one pistil of a syncarpus gynesium with one to 25 fused carpels, and there can be a superior, inferior, half inferior ovary. So as is evidenced, lots of variability in the floral characters. One thing that is interesting about the petals is that they are not actually petals at all, but rather petaloid staminodes. And what this means is that these are stamens that are infertile or sterile, that instead of developing into a filament in an anther to produce pollen, develop into showy petal-like stamens. So kind of replacing the petals for their function. The inflorescences are usually solitary on lateral branches or just one branch, or there's just a single flower produced per one plant, or they can less commonly be in cymes. The fruits are generally capsules that can open up when it rains or when it's dry. The leaves are mostly opposite and have cells on the epidermis called bladder cells that give the leaf and sometimes the stem too a bumpy appearance. I'll go into more detail about what a bladder cell is later on. And the plants can be herbs, shrubs, or subshrubs. Some can even be a tree-like organism. And they often form these large mats covering wide expanses of the ground. And most often they are succulent, but some of the early diverging members of the Azoaceae are semi-succulent. So they're, kind of, they're not super plump and fleshy. <laughs> now I will go into detail about the floral and vegetative features of each of the five subfamilies. First is the subfamily Sesuvioideae, which is a very, fairly small subfamily that includes four genera with just 36 species. These are found worldwide in the tropics and subtropics. Important synapomorphies for the genera traditionally included in the Sesuvioideae are flowers or inflorescences with bracts circumcisal capsules, and arillet seats. Let's look at these features more closely. On the left are examples of growth habits of sesuvioidea plants, which are usually annual or perennial herbs that are semi-succulent. The stems are, pro stems are prostrate, meaning they're lying on the ground. So the plants can form mats on the ground that can be spread a little bit. So you can notice that they're spreading along the ground due to the prostrate stems. Although hard to tell in these images, the leaves are oppositely arranged on the stem. The flowers themselves are not too large and not too showy. In fact, the perianth itself lacks petals entirely. What it has are sepals that on the interior side that we are sh seeing here are colorful, variety of colors, but on the exterior part of the sepal, it is green. So definitely differences in color of the sepals. And as a result, because there are no petals, the showy, colorful nature of the sepals is replacing the function of the petals. However, there are many stamens, as we'll see in many other members of this family. As for the gynesium, it has an axial placentation, where all the ovules are attached in a central placenta in the ovary. It is perigenous with a tube made from the fusion of the stamens and the calyx. 
and it has a yellow nectary at the base of the tube, which will be a bright about here. The fruit is a circumcisal capsule, which means that when the fruit has dried and matured, the top part of the capsule will pop off like a little lid to release the seeds. The seeds that are produced are the many brown little seeds that on the seed coat have a structure called an aril. An aril is a fleshy, kind of a fleshy seed coat that is used for extra nutritive uh, purposes and it's on the external portion of the seed coat. Hence the term aerolit seeds due to the aril on them. The next subfamily is called the subfamily Azoidae. The Azoidae is also another early diverging lineage within the Azoaceae. It is most diverse in South Africa, but and also has endemic species in Australia, Europe and Asia, and South America. It is made up of seven genera in 125 species. Early diversification of this subfamily occurred around 40 million years ago. And it's split into a mainly African lineage and lineages outside of Africa. So in Eurasia, Australia, other parts of Africa, and even South America. And this is what, as I mentioned earlier, there was a long distance transport of seeds and fruits by early humans and birds. As a result of these geographic splits, the Azoidae is divided into two clades called clade A and clade B. Clade A plants tend to grow just in Africa and clade B plants have a much wider distinct distribution including Australia, South America, and Europe. Example of a plant from clade A is the genus Azoan, and an example of a plant from clade B is Tetragonia. We actually have an invasive weed of Tetragonia called Tetragonia tetragonioides in California, or it's also called New Zealand spinach. Characters of, characteristics of the Azoidae, as well as the Sesuvioidae, are these semi-succulent leaves and flowers that are only made up of tepals that are colorful on the inside and green on the outside, or just not colorful on the outside. They also have bladder cells, so these little bumps on the leaves and the stems. You can kind of see that right here, these little tiny shiny bumps right there. Um, as for the gynecium, let's focus on a zoan in the clade A. For its gynecium, it has an inferior ovary with a hypanthium. And this hypanthium is a fusion, again, of the tepals or the sepals and the andresium. It also has axile placentation. So the ovules are attached to a central placenta. Meanwhile, Tetragonia has apical placentation. So some difference, some small differences between these two clades. The early diverging lineages, the Sesuvioidae and Azoidae, include a wide range of different fruit types such as circumcisal capsules, winged or variously sculptured nuts, such as this one, compound spiny fruits like these, and different types of capsules that open up when it's really, really dry or kind of wet. And it's really interesting because later diverging members of the Azoaceae do only have really one type of fruit. So the higher diversity of fruits in the early diverging lineages of AZOAC suggest a lot more strategies for dispersal. In the Tetragonia, the fruit is simple and is a strongly indehiscent nut-like fruit. But in Azoan, they have capsules. As for their seeds, they do not have arils but are ribbed. So the seed coat is a little ribbed like this.
kind of looking like a little shell. <laughs> the next subfamily is called the Acrosanthoidea. It is a very small subfamily made of just, just one genus called, the, called Acrosanthes. Due to many formerly unresolved phylogeny in this family in order, this sim fa subfamily was newly formed by Clack et al. in 2017. And because it was deformed so recently, many of the uh, cladograms I will show you will not have this subfamily name. Acrosanthes species are mat forming shrubs with needle like leaves right here with flattened bladder cells on the surface. As a result, they have kind of a smooth appearance to them. Like the two former suborders, petals are absent and they are green and sepaloid on the inside and white and petaloid on the interior. It's a really great contrast in these images here. Very, very beautiful. Each flower is solitary, tends to grow on lateral branches, not associated in an inflorescence. The flowers for their gynesium have a superior ovary with many stamens, just like we've seen before. Basal placentation, so the placenta is at the base of the ovary, and only two locules. The fruit is what's called a zero-castic capsule. Zero-castic means these capsules will only open when it's really hot and it's really, really dry. Now let's move on to the next subfamily, the subfamily Mesembryanthemoideae. Quite the mouthful. <laughs> this subfamily is also called ice figs or mesems or in South Africa, they are also called fagis, which comes from the Afrikaans word for small figs. So I think the fag is the name for fig in Afrikaans. And it's called that because the fruits, maybe not <laughs> of these, can resemble small figs. Obviously, these are not in the fig family, though. But phages is basically a term to describe, and mesens is a term to describe any plant in the azoaceae that has these, these really showy daisy-like flowers. Most phages only open their flowers fully in the sun when their shiny petals reflect the light in whites, pinks, and yellows really beautiful showy flowers in the beautiful lightly colored uh, lightly colored petals. The Mesembryanthemoideae includes about 103 species that are annuals in perennials or they can be woody shrubs and their leaves and stems are succulent. For example, here we have showy leaves of a really beautiful mes mesembryanthemum, very, very succulent leaves and stems. Many members of this subfamily have flattened leaves, and in many of them, both the leaves and the stems are covered with things called bladder cells. And I'll go into more detail about what bladder cells are, but there are these little tiny bumps on the epidermis of uh, both the stem and the leaf of many mesems or phages. The mesem flowers are very showy, unlike the more subdued flowers of the previous three subfamilies. The flowers themselves, again, usually solitary and have both a calyx and a corolla. However, this is slightly misleading, this corolla term, because the petals actually do not form from petal tissues at all, but form from stamen tissue. Thus, these petals are best called petaloid staminodes as opposed to true petals. However, same function. As for the fertile stamens, there are tons and tons of them, and probably in the hundreds. 
As for the ovary, the ovary is syncarpus and epigenous and is surrounded by a hypanthium formed from the fusion of the calyx, petaloid staminodes, and fertile stamens. The ovary also has axial placentation. We can see right here we have the ovary. See right here we have the ovary and the ovules attached to a central placenta. The fruits of mesims are quite unique too. They have loculicidal capsules with expanding keels. They have loculicidal capsules made up of several valves, usually between four and five. However, on the underside of the valve covers are structures called expanding keels. These expanding keels, when they get wet, expand and open up to release seeds from the capsule. The seeds that are within these capsules have uh, little bumps all over them, so we can see right here, and this is called, these are called papillae. So these seeds are called papillate seeds due to the many little papillae bumps on the seed coat. Mesembryanthemum was classified into five subgenera using molecular and morphological data by, done by Clack and Bruns in 2013 because there's a, an exceptional amount of shared genetic, genetic and morphological features among some not closely related species in the family. Consequently, a new classification of Mesembryanthemoideae was proposed with only a single genus, Mesembryanthemum, in five subgenera, including Phyllobolus, Cryophytum, Mesembryanthemum, Opophytum, and Volcaranthus. Since many species are quite similar, special attention when identifying these is required, including investigating the seed color, the how succulent the leaves are, and the presence or absence of succulent leaves. Now for the final subfamily, the Rusioideae. The Rusioideae, or the bright figs, is the most diverse family within the Azoaceae and has an astonishing diversity of leaf shape and growth forms. However, even though there are so many species, almost 1,600 species that are recognized within the morphologically diverse Rusioideae, these species show minimal variation in plastid DNA sequences. And this, I think, is because this is probably because they evolved so quickly within 5 million years. Like mesims, the Rusioideae have very showy, daisy-like daisy -like flowers and thick, succulent leaves. Here's an example of a habit in showy flowers, typical of the subfamily. The leaves of most of the family, uh, the leaves of most species in the subfamily, especially later diverging members that are most diverse, are called trigon trigonous leaf types. This basically means that they have three angles to them and they do not have the typical abaxial, adaxial, par, um, adaxial, abaxial arrangement in a flat leaf blade. The flowers of Rusioideae plants are really similar to Mesembryanthemoideae flowers, except for the fact they have parietal placentation. Plants in the Membryanthemoideae had axial placentation. They also have similar fruit capsules, but the fruit capsules in Rusioideae also have these little structures called membranes that surround the seeds when it, within, the cap, within each valve. This helps with the regulation of seed dispersal. They also have papillated seeds, so these little bumps all over the seed coat. 
The subfamily Rachioideae is comprised of four tribes called the Apatisiae, Dorotheanthiae, Delospermiae, and Rachiae. The tribe Apatisiae is a very small clade of only 11 species, which consists of annual or perennial plants with mostly flat leaves, and so not trigonous. They have flat, broad nectar rings in fruits with reduced expanded keels. I'll go into more detail about the nectaries in a few slides. The tribe Dorotheanthiae is made up of annuals with flat leaves and prominent bladder cells, segmented nectar ri rings, and fruits with expanded keels. In the tribe, the Delospermiae, it is character characterized by crystalline papillate leaves, rough to hispid internodes, and complete covering keels. So keels that go from the center of the of the fruit to the very end of the valve. Meanwhile, the tribe Rushier is the most diverse tribe that has ephemeral leaves with fused leaf bases, smooth nectaries, and wide tracheids. And this gives you an idea of the differences in species number. Now that's it for phylogeny and taxonomy. Now let's look at some of these morphological characteristics I described in more detail. The first characteristic I want to highlight is the unique capsule type in many Azoaceae plants. This, these types of fruits are, and capsules are called hygrocastic capsules. And in hygrocastic capsules, the moisture triggers the capsule to open and allows the seed to disperse. This is an adaptation that maximizes offspring survival during wet seasons. These types of capsules are typical for Mesembryanthemoideae and Rachioideae, and most, almost all genera of Azoideae, but not in the Sesuvioideae. The opening of the capsules, which I can... The opening of the capsules, done by the Toronto Cactus and Succulent Club YouTube channel, is achieved by the expanding keels, which swell when it, they become wet, and push the valves out of the capsule to open. Once they have opened, as it continues to rain, seeds are then splashed out by the capsule by rain droplets. As the capsule dries out, the expanding tissue within the expanding keels uh, pulls the valves closed. In this way, the seeds are dispersed over longer periods. A very, very amazing and beautiful process that occurs in these types of fruits. Another way to distinguish subfamilies apart is by what types of nectaries they have. While phages usually have a rich pollen load, nectar is another way to attract pollinators. Nectaries in the Azoaceae plants can come in a ring at the base or kind of close to the top of the flower. And if it comes in, a, in a, an entire ring, it's called a holo nectary. Or that ring can come in little segments of nectaries, and this is called a mesonectary. In the early diverging members, such as the Sesuvioideae, they have a hollow nectary that is only slightly elevated. It's not really very bumpy at all, or very protruded. It's very kind of very, very short nectary. For the Sesuvioideae, these types of nectaries that are really, really small and are not bumpy at all, are called plain nectaries. For Sesuvioideae, this plain hollow nectary is at the base of the steeple stamen tube. So that will be like right about here in this flower called Sesuvium. In the Azoideae, they also have plain hollow nectaries, but these nectaries are at the top of the tebal stamen tube. 
as we get to later diverging members in the Mesembryanthemoideae, they have what's called a mesomorphic coilomorphic nectary. <laughs> oh my gosh. But basically what this means is that the nectaries are come in little segments of a ring. And the coilomorphic means that the nectary is shaped like a little shell and it's hollow inside. And they tend to sit in this very, very narrow groove in between the hypanthium and the ovary. So they're going to sit right about here. Very, very narrow position. And finally, in the Rusioidea, they have what's called a, an, a lophomorphic bulging nectary. What this means is lophomorphic means the nectary is entire, but it is a little lobed on the edges. And bulging means it, it looks like it's being pushed out at the interface between the andresium and the ovary. This slide here gives a really good idea of what hollow nectary means. So look, it's in that ring, marrow nectary, as we see here, and lophomorphic versus coilomorphic nectaries. And this table done by Hartman and Niesler in 2009 gives a really good overview of the many characteristics I've shown you so far. So take a, a little bit to go over some of these characteristics. In addition to morphological differences, there are also differences in photosynthetic pathways among members of the Azoaceae. Before I compare what type of photosynthetic pathways each of the subfamilies have, we need to review what types of photosynthetic pathways are present in plants. The most common type is called C3 plants, in which the vascular bundles are surrounded by a very thin bundle sheath and have separate palisade and spongy mesophyll. For C4 plants, pretty much their entire mesophyll is made up of palisade cells or cells that contain chloroplasts. And the vascular bundles are surrounded by really large bundle sheath cells. And in C4 plants, the light-dependent reactions occur in the chloroplasts, in the palisade cells, but the light-independent reactions, or the Calvin cycle, occurs in the bundle sheath cells. Whereas in C3 plants, both of these reactions occur within the palisade cells. This C4 photosynthetic pathway is a really efficient pathway that gives plants much higher uh, photosynthetic rates, growth and reproduction, especially in nutrient-poor soils, and overall higher biomass production. And finally, there's CAM photosynthesis, in which where the light-dependent reactions occur during the day and the light-independent reactions occur at nighttime, because the light independent reactions uh, require CO2, and so the plant needs to bring carbon dioxide into the mesophyll, but this also helps to prevent water from being lost through the stomata during a very hot and dry day. Here is a cladogram showing the photosynthetic pathways of plants in the Azoaceae. Most of Rusioidea plants have him photosynthesis, which is very typical of succulent plants. As I alluded to earlier, leaf morphology in the subfamilies differ. In the early lineages, such as Sesuvioidea and Oezoidea, the leaf blades are flattened and have unexpanded leaf bases. However, in the Rusioidea, the early lineages still have flattened leaf blades, but their, ex their leaf bases are expanded. In the later diverging tribes, such as the tribe Rusioidea, they have cylindrical leaves and expanded leaf bases, so very plump, very succulent leaves that give them this trigonous leaf type. 
When we compare the anatomy of these leaf types, the simpler leaves, such as those in the Azoidea, have their vascular bundles in a nice neat row like this. And these vascular bundles are embedded in large water storing parenchyma cells. However, in the Rachioidea, the vascular bundles are kind of in a row, but there is one central vascular bundle and all of the water storage cells are right in the center of the leaf, kind of in the midrib area. And those, that central vascular bundle is surrounded by peripheral vascular bundles. This is what PVB stands for. But when we get to these trigonous leaves, there is just one central column of water storage parenchyma cells making up the bulk mass of the leaf. And there is a central and peripheral vascular bundles. Here is a comparison of light microscopy dyed leaves of leaves in the Azoaceae. Do you want you to notice here these large bundle sheath cells surrounding the vascular bundle? This plant mostly has most likely has a C4 photosynthetic pathway. I'm going to take time to look at some of these as well. And notice just how much bigger the water storage cells are in comparison to some of the other mesophyll cells. Another feature found on many leaves of Azoaceae plants is a type of trichome called a bladder cell. Bladder cells are generally found on the epiderm are found on the epidermis and they're a type of trichome which is a hair of sort, epidermal hair, that stores water and sequesters excess salt to keep it away from tissues that are more sensitive to high salinity. So these tend again tend to grow in sandy, very rocky soils. So all that salt embedded in those rocks and sand kind of gets transported to these bladder cells on the epidermal surface. These can be both on the leaves and the stems. Here's a cross section through a plant, a leaf in the Azoidea, where we have these large plump bladder cells on the epidermis. Awesome, now that we've learned about the taxonomy and features of Azoaceae plants, let's investigate the two genera that are required for the exam. The first genus that I'll cover is called Carpobrotus, which is in the subfamily Rushuidae. These are also called fig marigolds. And the name Carpobrotus derives from the Greek word karpos, meaning fruit, and brota, meaning edible. Most people I know, and even myself prior to making this presentation, generally call these ice plants. But that is actually the common name for the genus Mesembryanthemum. These are generally called sea figs or hottentot figs. There are 13 species in the genus, pretty much all of which are native to South Africa, but can also grow as invasive weeds in many other countries. They are subshrubs that are succulent and glabrous, so there really aren't any bladder cells on here, and if there are, they're very, very tiny. They can form extensive mats due to fast growing stolons, as we see here, that spread along the ground and set down roots. They also have opposite succulent leaves and stems, solitary flowers that grow on lateral branches, and they have petaloid staminodes. So none, these are not true petals here. These are petaloid staminodes. Another feature that I haven't mentioned but is present in pretty much all Caryophyllales is this pigment type called betalaeans. These types replace things called carotenoids or anthocyanins, which are responsible for providing color to flowers or leaves. If you can notice, there is uh, tinges of red on these leaves. Also on the fruits of Carpobrotus, they turn a nice, beautiful pink-red color, and that is due to betalaeans. 
So that is a replacement to carotenoids, which are present in a lot of other orders of plants. So let's look at some of these features as evidenced in these drawings. The leaves of Carpobrotus are very succulent and are mucilaginous when cut. Near the apex of the leaves, they can either be smooth margined or they can be roughly serrate or slightly serrated. This is actually a great way to distinguish between species. The leaves themselves that we see here are triangular in cross section due to the trigonous leaf type that they have. Notice there's one, two, three sides to these leaves. In the cross section in the bottom left here, the triangular shape is very obvious. The external layers are made up of chloroplasts containing chloranchyma or palisade cells. While the central portion and a great portion of the leaves are made up of water storage cells. These water storage parenchyma cells account for 69% of the leaf weight. Within the parenchyma cells, there is a central vascular bundle and peripheral vascular bundles, as is typical in the tribe Rushiae in the Rushioidae. Within the chloranchyma cells, there can also be secretory cells that excrete mucilage, and in some cases they excrete dark staining tannins. These tannins give these leaves a very astringent taste, which makes them basically inedible to foraging animals. Despite the juices and water in here, they're pretty inedible for most animals. Carpobrotus is a fast-growing plant due in part to its growth habit. The plants have above-ground stems called stolons here that can fragment from the parent plant and start a new plant entirely. This is a type of asexual reproduction or clonal reproduction. Adventitious roots that emerge from the stem then can dig into the ground from that stolon. On the right is an image of a stolon and the roots of a plant I collected in Humboldt County. And in the bottom is a root cross section I made of one of the adventitious roots showing the cortex and the vascular cylinder in the center with a star-shaped xylem pattern. As for the flowers, they are very large and showy. They have some of the largest flowers in the family. These flowers are solitary and are at the tips of branches. There are a couple succulent bracts below the pedicel of each flower. This pedicel is also succulent. And they have five succulent fused sepals that surround the petals and are kind of enclosed when the flower is in bud. The, what's really unique about the sepals is that they have unequal length of the sepals. So some of them are shorter and some of them are longer. And on some of the sepals, there's a brown membrane attached to the edges of them as well. That's a really great way to identify this plant. As for the corolla, it is made up of petaloids, hundreds of petaloid staminodes that de arrive fr derive from stamen tissue. And these petal petaloid staminodes are in several rows. You can kind of see here one, two, three rows right here. The andresium is made up of hundreds of stamens, at least the fertile, fertile stamens, with the stamens towards the base and kind of closer to the center of the plant kind of curved inwards, but stamens towards the outside kind of erect. Each of the filaments also have a little hairy base like we see here. When I was dissecting this plant, I it was hard to tell if these were fused together, the, at least the filament bases, or that there were so many hairs that were just interlocking with each other 
that made it appear that they refused. It was kind of hard to tell. As for the gynecium, it is a syncarpus gynecium with an inferior ovary. So it's a pigeonous with a hypanthium. And what's really interesting, it doesn't have a style at all, but rather just 8 to 12 digma lobes. If we take a cross section through the ovary, it has 8 to 12 carpels that are fused and parietal placentation. So note that the placenta is right here and right here and right here, and the ovules are attached to the placenta on the periphery of the ovary. The fruit of Carpobrotus is fleshy and round and turns yellowish to reddish purple in color as they mature due to pigments called betalanes. These fruits contain numerous seeds that are embedded in a sticky, sweet, and jelly-like mucilage. You can kind of see here, all this mucilage here produced by the secretory cells. These fruits are technically considered berries because they're indehiscent and don't have valves. And this is very different from all the other Brachioidea fruits and pretty much any other fruits in the Azoaceae. So very interesting. And within them, they have hundreds of thousands of brown seeds. The other genus required genus for the exam is called Mesembryanthemum. There are 108 species in the genus and are call, commonly called mesems or mesems. Mesembryanthemums are annuals or perennial herbs that have succulent leaves and stems, sometimes stems, with bladder cells. They have opposite leaves and are solitary flowers that are showy, but sometimes they can be enzymes. The leaves of mesems are plump and succulent and are covered throughout with bladder cells. In the left image, the glossy shine of these cells is pretty evident because they contain a lot of water that's reflecting off the sunlight. The central image shows the close-up of these really cool cells on, this, on the leaf. And some interesting anatomical features of the leaves are that they have these large water storage cells and a central vascular bundle. And they also, in their stomata, they have these large stomatal cavities that are used for cam photosynthesis to store gases until um, nighttime. As for the growth habit, like Carpobrotus, mesems grow with stolons and adventitious roots. The stems themselves can be woody or succulent, and they have bladder cells often. In the bottom center image is a stem cross section of a mesembryanthemum in the subgenus Phyllobolus. It shows the vascular cambium in the center, this ring bladder cells on the epidermal layer, and a cortex with cortical bundles as these green splashes. These are cortical vascular bundles in the cortex. The root system of mesembryanthemums is fibrous, as we can see right here. The flowers of mesems are showy, but not as large as those in the genus Carpobrotus. They have four fleshy sepals that are fused together in the calyx, hundreds of petaloid staminodes right here, fertile stamens with fused hairy filament bases, very similar to Carpobrotus, and a basifixed anther. The gynecium is syncarpus and has an inferior ovary that's a pigeonous with a hypanthium. It doesn't have a style. It has five, four to five stigma lobes, which coincides with the four to five carpels present with axile placentation. The left image right here is a really great uh, representation of all of these features.
The fruits of mesems are hygrogastic loculicidal capsules. <laughs> Quite the mouthful there. Uh, but basically they open up when it's raining. They have four to five valves, and they have expanding keels and numerous brown seeds, such as this, that have these little papillae on the seed coat surface. This is a cross section through a seed with definitely showing the papillae on the seed coat. Now, Asoaceae flowers, in general, even the small ones, produce large amounts of pollen. They also have unspecialized morphology, so pretty much any insect or animal can access them. And pollen presentation, it's not difficult to access the pollen. And as a result, they are visited by a wide variety of generalized pollinators. They are most, mostly visited by bees and beetles, but they can also be visited by flies and butterflies. Here are examples of bee species in genera if you are interested in entomology. Now I'll, f I'll finalize talking about the flowers and plants in this family by talking about the required genera and species for the exam. The first one is Carpobrotus. Carpobrotus is found on coastal scrub, grasslands, chaparral, bluffs, dunes, and beaches. There are two species in California, Carpobrotus edulis and Carpobrotus chilensis. However, they are so similar to each other and they're not native to California, so the exam only requires that you know the genus name. However, if you are interested in learning about the differences between the two species, you'll have to look at differences in general flower color, flower diameter, leaf tip margin, Carpobrotus edulis has serrated tips, leaf tips, while Chilensis has smooth leaf tips and leaf cross section, where edulis has very strongly um, angular leaf triangles and Chilensis has a little bit more rounded leaf cross section triangle of a triangle. But you might be asking, well, this plant and everything else you've been talking about is native to South Africa or Southern Africa. Why is, and we see here in this distribution, it's widely dispersed throughout California coastlines. But why is it so present, prevalent in California and how did it get here in the first place? Was it natural? No. Cal uh, Carpobrotus was introduced in the early 1900s as an erosion stabilization tool that was first used on railroad tracks and then later used by Caltrans on roadsides. So you'll often see these along freeways. However, uh, this newcomer fared extremely well in California's sunny, cool climate and spread rapidly up and down the coast due in part to its fast growth rate and clonal fragmentation, so it was able to spread really quickly. Unfortunately, sea figs, because they're not native to this area, wreak havoc on local ecosystems by taking water, light, and nutrients away and space away from native species. This species can form impenetrable mats that cover the ground, smother native species, and reduce the regeneration of native flora. To make matters worse, sea figs also have heavy leaves and shallow roots that can destabilize coastal soils and in even increase the amount of landslides. It's just the exact opposite effect of what they were initially brought in for. As for the soil, they change soil chemistry because they add extra salt to the soil, which makes the soil actually quite toxic to native plants that are not adapted to high salinity soils. And to make matters even worse, animals cannot really eat these because the, the leaves have such an astringent quality to them that it's they're very impalatable. So the best way to re 
to remove these are to do it by hand and herbicide treatment in the winter time when native plants have died back. As for Mesembryanthema, this <laughs> does have an actual required species called Mesembryanthema notiflorum or slender leaf ice plant. This plant grows on coastal bluffs of the California coastline and the Channel Islands where it was initially introduced, I believe, for ornamental purposes. While not as mat forming as Carpobrotus, this species can form small clumps of, with slightly narrow succulent leaves. And they have these very beautiful showy flowers here. So those are all of the taxa and morphological features that you will <laughs> I have for you today. And I want to end this presentation talking about the many uses of azoaceae plants. Because in California, we generally think of these as quite a nuisance. Even though they're quite beautiful, they're very detrimental to the habitats in which they reside in California. However, in Southern Africa, they have many traditional uses and ecological purposes. In Southern Africa, the leaves are eaten by tortoises, while the fruits are eaten by many mammals like antelopes, rodents, and baboons right here. Because they form these large mats, snakes like cobras can hide in these mats and attack rodents uh, that are attracted to the fruits. In Southern Africa, there are two tribes called the Koe Koe and San people who are indigenous nomadic pastoralists and hunter-gatherers, respectively. When the Dutch arrived to South Africa, they found the Koe Koe using fajis in many different ways. Some examples that the indigenous people of Southern Africa used azoaceae plants were with copper brotus, which was used for cuts, eczema, insect bites, ringworm, sunburn, and sore throats. So many medicinal purposes. And the fruits can also be used for soap making, preserves, dried fruits, and poultices. Another very commonly used plant in the Azoaceae in Southern Africa is in the genus Scaledium. Scaledium, especially Scaledium tortuosum, has been used by Southern South African pastoralists and hunter-gatherers, the Koe Koe and San people, as a mood-altering substance since prehistoric times. Traditionally, the leaves were dried and were often chewed and the saliva were swallowed. The, these leaves then can be used to relieve pain and alleviate hunger. Nowadays, the plant has been commercialized as an antidepressant and to reduce anxiety and has also gained popularity in the past few decades among weed smokers as an alternative and a legal <laughs> high to marijuana. You can even buy this plant from numerous suppliers. However, because the consumption, though, is so common in the region in which it resides, this particular species is endangered and actually over harvested um, for its many purposes. But it does have a lot of traditional uses and purposes in the indigenous people for the indigenous people in Southern Africa. All right. Well, that is my presentation about the Azoaceae. I hope you enjoyed learning about the numerous taxonomy, phylogeny, morphological characteristics, and anatomy and traditional uses of this family. Thank you so much for listening. And my next plant family will be the Aliaceae or the onion family. So be on the lookout for that one. Have a great day. Bye.